11 and I want to I want to get as much time to talk with you all as we possibly can in this next hour. So I don't want to delay any further. Um, I'd like to, first of all, just say thank you and welcome all of our guests to our coffee hour this morning. Um, and I am so honored to have um, Joan and her family with us. Um, Joan Matthew and Elisa Sabaggio. Did I say that right? Sabaggio Countryman are connected by much more than a family name a bloodline and a Yale University legacy. Nothing to sneeze at for sure. Um, but they're also united by a common interest in the fight for social justice. And Joan, who I've had the privilege to know for a number of years now, served as our board chair for the Kennel Corporation um, and has worked alongside us for, for so long, um, was an early supporter of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in the 1960s when she befriended and worked alongside Ella Baker, John Lewis, and other seminal figures of the civil rights movement. 50 years later, Joan's son, Matthew, is a professor of history and Afro-American Afro and African studies at the University of Michigan, where his fields of study include African-American social movements, 20th century US history, and public memory of the civil rights movement. In addition to working on behalf of the LGBTQ movement, Matthew's daughter, Alicia, during her own time at Yale, was part of a movement which led the university to change the name of its residential colleges, one of its residential colleges, from that of a 19th century slavery supporter, John Calhoun, to honor one of its most distinguished alumna, Grace Murray Hopper, a trailblazing computer scientist brilliant mathematician and teacher and dedicated public servant. And how appropriate, Alicia, that you were so involved in that movement. Um, so I, I would love to um, turn this over to both of you, all three of you, to share a little bit about yourselves and, and what brought you here today um, as we get started. And, and Matthew, I'll turn it over to you because I think you're gonna take us on a little journey here. Thanks so much, Lynn. Yes, we, in addition to all everything you said, we also share a family a commitment to photographs. So we thought we'd do is show a little, a few photographs um, that sort of trace all of our involvements in social justice, racial justice movements, and particularly as they connect to uh, Yale University in New Haven. And we're going to try to do that very quickly um, so that we can really get to the conversation afterwards. But so I am going to share a screen and show you some photos uh, um, first. So here we go. And we'll, we're going to start, my, my mother's going to start talking with the first photo. So in the first photo, photo you see me on the right. Uh, my husband, Peter Countryman, is, is standing next to me. And we are in New Haven, where we, uh, for four, five years, uh, lived uh, and began to raise our two children before uh, we both had... Uh, in, in 66, we um, uh, received our master's degrees at Yale. Matt, I move? You know, Would so, you want to just say what you were doing quickly in New Haven, what, what the significance of that photo is? <laughs> As if I remember. <laughs> <laughs> That, well, it was the organizing in the hill. So. Yeah, well, uh, we lived on on the hill, which on the neighborhood right next to, to, right behind Yale New Haven Hospital, and in fact, we had moved to that neighborhood in order to support uh, the all the issues that people in a in a poor neighborhood in New Haven cared about, particularly education and um, and uh, economic development. Uh, everything you can imagine in the mid 60s. And we're going to leave you in a state of suspense about the other photos because we're going to get to those <laughs> to those moments uh, in a few minutes. But um, it's going to take you now up to Philadelphia in 1944, 46, something like that. And sometime my family moved to Germantown, Northwest Philadelphia in 1944. And my mother and I and my the dog Laddie are sitting there on our lovely lawn on Upsell Street. Um, and uh, actually, I, I, I was probably maybe four or five in that, probably possibly five in that picture. 
uh, and certainly aware that there was something special about our moving to that neighborhood. Namely that, um, <laughs> I was gonna say, I, it, namely that uh, we were allowed to buy a house there and I now understand better what redlining was, but I didn't of course understand when I lived there, um, the impact that redlining had on, on my parents' choice of a house. And now we're, we've moved to, to uh, Bronxville, New York and Sarah Lawrence. And uh, there I am in the middle of this picture of, 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 of the picket line in front of Woolworths. Uh, one of the, the uh, most uh, powerful uh, events on my uh, interest in activism was the, was the sit-ins in, in Greensboro, North Carolina in, in, in 1960. And, as a, a student and an undergraduate in a small liberal arts college in, in New York, uh, I was a, among those leading the, the, the uh, group that wanted to support the students in the South by, by, um, by pointing out that Woolworths had uh, uh, participated in rejecting uh, uh, Black, uh, black uh, Customers, uh, to, or not allowing black people to sit at the at the lunch counters. Uh, this picture, by the way, I found out is in the museum, the Civil Rights Museum in in Atlanta. And <laughs> my children's, uh, my grandchildren's friends kept noticing that I was there. <laughs> um, so now I'm going to take over. Um, uh, I was uh, uh, grew up in Philadelphia, uh, which is where my parents moved when I was uh, four years old in 1967, uh, and um, uh, grew up fortunate to grow up, you know, in the midst of um, my mother's extended family with my grandparents, uh, um, part of our daily lives, um, and then um, and 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 very much within the notion of as, as a mixed race family that that we were. A family that um, you know that that was a product in ways uh, of the civil rights movement and of those kinds of activism, and and that that was um, something that was very important to me to understand who I was as I as I grew up. And so then in in 1981, in the fall of 1981, um, <laughs> six months or nine months into Ronald Reagan's administration, I arrived in New Haven as a freshman, um, uh, and a year later, my sister joined me. Um, uh, that's her to um, well, who I'm holding hands with in this photograph, uh, and um, um, became involved in, in 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 many a number of issues there. Uh, actually, starting with um, uh, anti opposition to the draft and to the uh, nuclear arms race. Um, uh, uh, later on, as I um, um, by this point I'm a junior. Um, um, there was a very prominent strike of uh, clerical and technical workers um, uh, there that 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 um, I was and my sister and I were both involved in supporting. Um, this photograph is a bit dramatic, um, and so it's, it doesn't it, you shouldn't over interpret it. Um, well, it looks like we're surrounded by five very very large police officers. In fact, if you see that one head peeking over my shoulder, there's a bunch of other protesters there as well. Um, but. Uh, there was this, this was a um, civil disobedience in support of the strike. And um, we were, my sister and I were, had just decided to, to, we didn't usually do stuff together like this. We were very, very much into our own worlds, but we had decided to go to this demonstration together and we were waiting to be arrested uh, or to be put to, to, to walk very calmly onto a, onto a school bus that they're arresting people on. And this photographer from the Hartford Current took this photo and he asked our names and I was very nervous suddenly because I realized he, he might think we were married to each other because we had the same last name. And, uh, and so I was very eager to tell him that this was my sister um, and that you can't see the caption here actually says Rachel Countryman and her brother Matthew, which um, made everybody very um, uh, amused by that. And then my mother took the photograph and turned it into a Christmas card and sent it to all her friends so that, um, to tell you something about this legacy. Um, and then this next picture is is um, and ties back to the first picture of me on the on the 
opening photo. This is from the anti-apartheid movement at Yale, which came short, shortly after that strike the following year. Um, what you can't see in the picture is that we have built a shanty town right here in front of the building here, which is the main um, administration building where the president's office is. Um, and I like this picture simply because this is this gives you a feel for how we organize. That this is a um, we are uh, having an, a, a meeting for whoever wants to participate, um, following negotiations with the university over um, whether we get to keep the shanty and and. There you can see me with my, with, you know, in, in deep, <laughs> in intense thought as I put my hand on my forehead, trying to figure out what our next move is going to be with, with a bunch of my friends uh, who, who I continue to, to stay in touch with. So, And his, gonna... his friends, uh, as you can see them, tolerating his Quaker behavior and getting everybody, <laughs> everybody to participate. <laughs> But we did. We we were making decisions here by consensus in this in this open air forum. It was pretty it was pretty amazing. So I'm going to turn this over now to to my to my daughter Alicia. Awesome, thanks, Dad. Um, and so I am class of 2018 um, and showed up in 2014 at Yale, bright eyed, very excited, but also having received a tour from my father the year before, where instead of being like, oh, that's where I went to the dining hall and this is where I played sports, he mostly was like, so I got arrested over there and I got arrested <laughs> over there. And you see over there, that's where we had that fight with the. <laughs> so I already was showing up, kind of knowing that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there was this past history of my family being very active um, on campus, um, but mostly just being excited to be, you know, surrounded by like-aged people looking to expand the horizons. Um, and I just didn't really understand um, the that how quickly you can fall into national, nationally aware protests. And so in 2015, um, I was part of the Black Student Alliance at Yale, part of um, the Office of LGBTQ Resources, um, and just generally in a lot of spaces thinking and, and, and talking about resources towards students of color and um, the ways that the university was kind of really eager to present all the student body is very diverse, but not necessarily willing to put the resources towards ensuring that um, these students were protected, um, were cared for, and ultimately, uh, that their, their peers were educated around the ways in which um, students of color, you know, uh, <laughs> students of color come from very different backgrounds. Um, students of color often are uh, not legacies. Uh, they have to work multiple jobs. And so just bringing up a lot of the ways in which our EL experiences were different um, and forcing the university to realize that, reckon with it, and support uh, students more actively. So, and you might remember that in 2015, that was a moment of a lot of uh, student protests. So it wasn't just Yale University. Amherst was looking to um, rename their entire uh, mascot. University of Mizzou was looking to remove um, their president. And we were just part of that moment that said, hey, um, we need to actively think about better including uh, black people, women, women of color, queer people into higher education if we want our, our society to move forward more equitably. Um, so in this picture, we are protesting the uh, name of uh, basically a dorm being named after John C. Calhoun um, and just saying that at Yale, basically your dorm is, is your identity. I'm, I'm in Calhoun College, I'm in Silliman College and basically saying you really can't have black students walking around saying, I'm in John C. Calhoun College. Um, and shouldn't we have a name that better reflects uh, our values today? And so this was um, one of the renaming ceremonies that students did when the university refused to rename the college. And then a year later, dad, if you want to go to the next page, this is um, the, the school formally renaming uh, Calhoun a year late, but still a really momentous event. Um, and I woke up that day hearing that the school, the college is renamed, but also finding that my photo had been put on the, the cover of the YDN, the Yale Daily News. So um, lots of setbacks, lots of non-victories, but this was definitely one in the win column that I'm, I'm still proud of today. So thank you for tolerating our family reminiscences there for a second. So. <laughs>
you know, not your typical, typical family <laughs> upbringing, right? Uh, Alicia, I, I can't imagine that college tour as your father is showing you where he was arrested and all of those things, but it doesn't, you know, it does really I, I speak to what was your growing up like for each of you? Because it, this is probably generational. It obviously is right here, three generations, but Joan, even as you were growing up, what, what was that like for each of you to grow up? And, and what were those conversations around the civil rights movement? And, you know, it, it, it just really highlights how long this has been going on, how long it's been a part of our history, but, you know, what, what, what was it that inspired you as, as you grew up as a young child? It's almost as if it was just became part of you. Well, you know, you're, I, I'm glad that you see that picture of, of me with my mother uh, sitting on the lawn. Uh, my mother had stories of um, actually of her family. My mother grew up in Baltimore and uh, she, I, I just knew that there were things that happened in Baltimore that had to do with fighting for justice and, and including my her story, my grandmother, whom I loved very much and was very much part of our of my uh, family life growing up, my mother's mother, uh, who uh, could not she could shop in this in the department stores in downtown Baltimore, but she she couldn't she couldn't try on clothes. Uh, she could call up and have this clothes sent to her house as she lived in a fairly nice house. Um, and and that was that was the only way that she could uh, find out if if the if this, her selection was appropriate. Um, and I uh, so I, those are the kinds of stories that I was told and I knew about and I knew, for example, that that was one of the reasons that we never went south. <clears throat> My parents um, very carefully uh, wanted their their two daughters uh, not to experience, um, um, you know, the, the uh, colored bathroom, colored water fountains, all those, the kinds of signs and, and experiences that they had um, had to grow up with. Uh, so that, that um, by the time I was in high school, um, you know, <laughs> I, there's a couple of things that I that I that I still remember as as key moments in my life. One was coming home from school on the day that the um, Brown versus Board of Education uh, decision was announced, and my mother insisted that I sit with her in front of the television and watch the news report of of that, um, which is not so surprising because I, I, has, I was busily integrating Germantown Friends School at the time. I was the oldest student of color um, there at the, uh, when I was in, well, I was from third grade on. And then the, the next year was Emma Till. Uh, and of course, the, the outrage uh, of the, for that, um, for his, murder um, was part of what we talked about. So there was always a sense that there was work to do uh, to make uh, the country uh, healthier for everybody. And so on. The, and I'll just say, as I said, you see in that picture that the sit is actually it was my mother who told me that she met some of the Greensboro people at a, I don't know what, some meeting in, in Philadelphia. And she, she, uh, she was, part of the reason I organized that, that picket line in, in New York um, because of her enthusiasm for, for student activism. Wow, that's amazing. So, you know, I mean, that's, this is an important point about my grandmother, my mother's mother, how much she was the family center. Um, she, she hadn't, you know, she was the one, she hadn't been able to go to college. She had a, she had had a, a scholarship to go to uh, Morgan State College, but couldn't afford in the depression to to use it. Uh, she had to, to work and care for her, her younger siblings. But she was the gravitas. She was the center point of so much of the family and this family stories. And it was sitting at the table at my grandparents' house, listening to these stories, most of which were about the importance of education <laughs> and, and uh, in a world in which, you know, in which Black people didn't couldn't expect 
fairness. Um, um, but also, you know, the ways in which that these stories conveyed what it meant to be mixed race and why it was important that we were a mixed race family. Um, you know, it's, I mean, my version of, of, of my, of Elisa's story about the tour is that I was raised on the story about how the SNCC freedom singers came to New Haven the week I was born, um, to give a fundraising concert. And afterwards, everybody came over to the, to the apartment, um, uh, my parents' apartment to 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 literally christen this a newborn baby with with we shall overcome, and, um, <laughs> which was a which was a you know pretty intense story for a little boy to listen to. But then my grandmother would always tell the joke afterwards that she was all, all she could think about was the germs for the, this poor child <laughs> who encountered from these young people who, you know, she thought it was slightly irresponsible. <laughs> um, and so that you know that kind of of of. Um, you know, very important stories, but but also the family lore around them was was something that that, that you know was this, it gave a, a sense of connection and identity to it. You know, and uh, um, you know, and the other only other thing I'll add to that sort of about my own. So I don't have quite the Emmett Till story, and and um, but I was thirteen when the um, Children of Soweto um, protest started in in South Africa, which is probably the first time I'd ever even heard of South Africa or learned anything about it, and it was far away and. It, I don't know that I felt real connected to it, um, but you know when 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 then when I was in college when when the anti-apartheid anti -apartheid movement had had um, become an international movement and in, in which there was a clear thing that again a national movement that we could join for to, for divestment, you know that sense that this was our generation's challenge was very much something that I felt and um, and it was not only something to understand about a great racial injustice far, far away, but it was also a way for us to understand, um, you know, the contradictions of a place like New Haven where there was great wealth on this campus and yet surrounded by, um, by poverty that was racially, you know, um, a part of a structural racism in, in our society. And, and, and to make, you know, and so that was the, you know, we understood that when we were protesting Yale's investments policy, we were also, protesting Yale's failure to, to, to address poverty right around it. I, I have to just interject that my, my mother also said that the baby, Matthew, genuflected whenever <laughs> anybody sang, we shall overcome. So. Sort of was my theme song. <laughs> <laughs> you, you really had no choice. It was <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Alicia? Yeah. So I think like when I have been thinking about being raised, I think there's like the very intentional, we're going to make sure that the civil rights movement is a part of her upbringing. And then there's just the like, you know, you're a black person living in America. And so these are certain realities of, of growing up. And um, so there are certain things like my picture books <laughs> had a whole range of just great stories. And I think in particular, I remember this one book that I probably read like 12 times, which was just a Nelson Mandela picture book, mini chapter thing. Um, and I, I remember being like, this is such a fun story. And then at some point I was like, oh wait, this is a real person. <laughs> so the, the, I think that's like a, a good indication of how like just when these things are embedded into, you know, the stories that are told at the dinner table and all of your books and like your dolls are black and all, like, there's just a, a, a slow realization as you get older of how serious the stakes are for many of these things. And that wasn't necessarily because, you know, I was sat down and my dad was like, these things are scary, right? But it was just like, I learned about, yeah, this was part of my life. And as I got older, my understanding of them became more sophisticated. Um, I think a lot of, the stories that I heard that weren't through the lens of like, this is a, a activism that we did, but it was more of me asking questions like, how did you and mom meet? Like, grandma, why were you in New Haven, right? Like all of these things that were more about me learning about my family happened to be stories that were like, oh, and that was tied into because that was the year that JFK was assassinated, right? Like, so all of, I was learning history because these things were shaping uh, who I, who I came, who the shaping the people that I was coming from and, and trying to understand better. Um, and, and, you know, I think it was also, it could also be sometimes surprising because I was raised not in Philadelphia, I was raised in Anna, Michigan with two parents that were desperately trying to raise two kids and be professors and manage all of the things that life throws at them. And so 
it wasn't necessarily that activism was super present in my everyday as a as a young child. Um, and I think as a result, it felt like it was mine and not necessarily something that I had to do. But when Trayvon Martin was murdered when I was 15, I wanted to do something about it and I wanted to figure out like who to yell at, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so it wasn't really until college later that I started leaning upon my grandma and my dad and uh, to hear their stories and hear their thoughts about activism. Like in high school, it was very much about, I'm gonna tweet that I'm angry and I'm going to be part of my generation responding to the, to the um, social injustices that we're seeing around us. You know, it strikes me as, you know, as children and you grow up with these superheroes and in so many ways, the, the people you were surrounded by that you were interacting with and the stories you heard really were about real life superheroes who were putting their own lives on the line to really impact change and what incredible role models and, you know, examples of, you know, it's different, I think, when you're reading it in a history book, right? Or it's when, when you know, you, you feel that experience that each of you brought to the table as you were raising your families or growing up yourselves. Were there, I, at least you just kind of spoke to this, were there, were, were there certain things in your life as you were growing up that really galvanized? I, and I would imagine that Trayvon Martin, that really had to be something that inside of you brought all of this to life and, and really made it real, right? Rather than just the stories you were hearing at the table. Absolutely. I mean, I think Trayvon Martin's death and then also the subsequent, uh, I believe it was a non-indictment decision. Um, it was the acquittal. He was tried. And was acquittal. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, those were, those were big and, and both because I was starting to understand in real time that we hadn't made as much progress as I was told in class, right? Um, but but also because I, I, was, I was going to school with a lot of white people and white kids who just weren't having the reaction, the emotional reaction that I was having. Um, and, and trying to, I think it was both trying to understand what was going on in the world and then also trying to explain it to folks around me who, who didn't have it hit as home as hard. Um, and so I, I think like there was the macro level events that were going on in the country. And then there was the, the micro interactions with my peers um, and my teachers um, and, and like being very unpolished, right? Being a 16 year old lashing out um, is, is formative in that um, I quickly had to figure out how to, how to take anger and make it uh, understandable, powerful, persuasive. Um, and, and those are things that I definitely learned from going over small events with my family and saying like, how do I handle this? This is insane. Um, and and not, not less hearing about how they handled past their own experiences, but hearing them, helping them, like having them guide me through the tough times that were just inherent in, in what it means to grow up as black. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's... You know, I think that's, it, it, it's right. It's, I mean, it's a very important because it's not, uh, yes, we, it, this is a legacy that we all connect to, but at the time it's, it's not so much about, I have to do this, but rather this is what I want to respond to and, 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 and what, what's in the toolkit and how do I, how do I understand what's, what the response is, you know, for me arriving, um, and at, at college, you know, I mean, the specific things were were the nuclear arms race, as well as the impact on a city like New Haven of the of the change in urban policy from the Carter to the Reagan administration. Um, and you know, so there was continuity with the issues my parents had worked on in terms of race and poverty, but not because I brought it, but because that was what was happening around me. I mean, I think in that sense, we are all three of us a product of those moments of those formative moments of, of how you make sense. And, you know, I certainly am very aware with not only my children, but my students that to have come of age politically in a period of, of rising conservatism, like I did, um, produces different expectations, different perspectives on events, you know, and, and, um, you know, my students, I mean, they're, 
that my children <laughs> at the same age, um, you know, they have a vision of what's possible that I, that astounds me. I mean, and, and, and it's, you know, it's, it's not instinctive to me. I have to, you know, I have to catch up because they will not tolerate kinds of inequality. They will not tolerate, um, um, you know, uh, injustice in the police force. I mean, even the, <laughs> even the, the debate over Calhoun college, you know, I, I have, you know, through connections to old friends and through Facebook and talked, I was talking to lots of black alums at the time, all of us who lived, went to Yale and knew Calhoun college existed and didn't really like it and never thought, why would we do anything about it? <laughs> it never occurred to us that it was something you would change because it was just part of this strange institution that we were trying to navigate. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so my daughter's generation was, why would you put up with that more than an, uh, another second, you know, and, and, uh, and, and I guess and I'm enough of a historian to understand that that's the same thing that my mother's generation was saying to their parents about, about lunch counter segregation. Why would you put up with this? And then, and their parents were saying, really hamburgers, <laughs> really, that's what you're going to focus on. Get a, get a degree, get it, you know, you can grow up first and then you can solve all these problems. And, and, you know, so that that generational politics mm-hmm. is also always a part of all of this. You know, it's it certainly is. And Matthew and I talk a lot about the, being aware of three generations. I mean, I, because I'm a grandparent, I say I cannot understand what they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, I, I want to say that that my parents, when people ask me about what it was like for me to be the oldest, uh, only black graduate at, at, or whatever of many places, but in particular, coming through Germantown Friends. And I, my parents were uh, the reason. It's, they were the reason I survived. They were the reason I thrived. Um, and, and as Matthew said, they were committed to education and they understood the strengths of, of a, a Quaker school and that particular Quaker school. They also found a, a spiritual home in, in the Germantown meeting and they're buried in the, in, in the what we call, still call the active graveyard in, at Germantown <laughs> on Coulter Street. Um, and it, it, for me, and particularly for my time, to have parents like that who could listen and help us, help me and my friends navigate, uh, made all the difference. Yeah. I think it's probably very scary. I mean, you all tell me, like, it's probably very scary to have your child navigate these things that you know are incredibly harmful. And so I know, I remember um, my freshman year, we were protesting uh, fossil fuel investments and trying to get uh, a divestment from fossil fuels at Yale. And me and my friends got got arrested. Um, And my mom called me and she's like, what are you doing? It's exam season. Are you kidding? Like, just so angry. And I was like, mom, why are you mad? Like, you got arrested too. Like, it's fine. Like, it's a $70 fine. I'm okay. It was a Yale arrest. It wasn't a real arrest. Right? Like, it's really not that big of a deal. In fact, I wish it was bigger. And I was just like, what do you mean? We got arrested when we were seniors. You're a first year. And I was like, like that's not. <laughs> But I absolutely like would feel that tension of um, my my parents and and and, my, and trying to navigate how to protect me and prepare me and and empower me and and like sometimes doing one more than the other and um and and kind of having to make that decision on the fly um which you know now as a, as we're, we're, everything's great I feel very well set up and very grateful but at the time I think looking back I can see how fraught and how uh, nerve-wracking those decisions would, would have must have been. Yeah, as a parent, I can only imagine. I mean, you you probably vacillate between being extremely proud of your activism and what you're doing to impact change, but at the same time, well, you know, it's interesting because that story that about happen. about my grandmother and the and the christening. I mean, I came to understand that as I got older, and maybe as I became a parent, that you know, in fact, my grandparents, as much as proud as they were of my parents, were also terrified for them. And for the, those babies, right, all the time, um, and you know, and, and so in that sense, they're yeah. I mean, I, this is. I mean, I'm extrapolating a little bit, but they're because, of course, I didn't know that as a little kid. I just knew that we I had these wonderful grandparents who, you know, and sometimes who were reliable in ways. Certainly, that my father wasn't always reliable, um, and, and and so, 
you know, to me was, but I can, you know, as I think back to it, in other words, they, they dealt with that, that anxiety by being there, right. And being supportive and, 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 um, and obviously, I mean, I know stories of other people's parents whose parents reacted negatively to their to their kids' activism. But in, in, in our family tradition, I think it's the despite the, the phone calls where you say, what are you doing? Right. Nobody's ever going to abandon you. We're always going to be there and, and, yeah. and support you. There's a question that uh, was asked about things we disagreed about. And, and, and so I just I was laughing to myself because one of the that 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 um, very strident 15 year old that you all heard about was also very adamant about pronouns. <laughs> and believe me, her parents, who think of themselves as progressives in all kinds of ways, were completely flummoxed by pronouns, <laughs> partly because they're just not grammatical in our minds, right? <laughs> they doesn't make any sense. And we are as old school as anybody about that. But also because it was something that, you know, it was hard to make sense of because it was on the one hand deeply important to her. We didn't come from us at all. Um and she always wanted to fight about them. But we were like, look, we don't, you know, we don't get it, but, and that's fine. But why do we, do we have to have this conversation again at dinner? Like this is the third time this week, um, <laughs> you know, and, and we, you know, I was always trying to, I mean, this is, I was always trying to make peace around it. And, you know, she was not having it. She was going to be right. And she was going to get me to, to, to change. And, you know, and eventually I've learned how to use they as a pronoun. I had no choice. <laughs> <laughs> but you know it, it, yes this is we're not this was no like you know we are we are can't we all get along all the time no this was a typical adolescent who and uh, you know and, and uh, you know i raised two adolescents i know what it's like to raise adolescents they're challenging you know and, and just when you don't want them to be challenging that's the moment they have you know they have to have this conversation with you about something you wrong, you know did wrong whether it's about pronouns or recycling or or you know, something you said about a student or whatever it was, you know, that was, that was always very contentious stuff. And, you know, and my, and, and I talked about my grandparents dining room table and how fun, how much I learned from those deep conversations. Well, they were very difficult conversations that they, people were having about justice and about the Vietnam war and about um, all kinds of things. Right. So that, that's the other thing. Yeah. We, we were, we're, as a teenager and, and having those conversations, were you, were you involved? Were you a part of those conversations or was it more of a listening and, and trying to figure out what to do with all of that? I can't, I, mean, I just it's interesting. picture that, that. Yeah. I don't, I mean, I don't, I, I mean, I, my, so my memories are from being younger, frankly, and watching and just being fascinated. Yeah. I, I think I probably didn't participate in them. I mean, you know, it's a pretty formidable group of people. <laughs> Getting your word in it twice <laughs> was always a bit of a challenge. Um, but on the other hand, you know, I mean, I, you know, and we, we've sort of, my father is a long story, so I won't t- tell it. But one of the things about my father is that he was somebody, I'd spent hours with him when I was, and he was, my parents divorced when I was pretty young. So I spent weekend, you know, and, and, and long hours talking politics. He was always teaching me about, mm-hmm. Uh, on the world. Eventually, you know, some of the tensions between us came to, came around what we disagreed about. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that, but, but, you know, no, my father, I mean, I was very much politically educated, not to necessarily do what I, you know, he was very, do what you, what you want with this, but here's, here's how I view the world. Here are the things I care about. Here are the things that I think need to change in the world. And that's something that I, of course, ate up. I mean, the attention of one's, particularly when it's, you know, as a divorced child, the attention of one's um, non-custodial parent is a, is a, is a, is it, it's precious. And so that was very important to me. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's important. Like we were we were provided with um, a plethora of, of resources. So like I remember I was I was allowed to read anything at any age. Like I was there was never censorship of what I read. And I remember one time I came back with a book that had been giving me and I was loving it. It was a it was by William F. Buckley. And my dad was like, oh <laughs> 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 it's fascinating i'm learning about the supreme court <laughs> but i that your response was like well if you want to talk about it we can talk about it but it wasn't at all a censorship or trying to put guardrails around my political understanding of the world um i think it, if anything it was like i have these great resources to talk to when i come up against these tough issues i mean i did that yesterday i called my dad and i was like we need to talk about palestine and israel like I, i'm trying to understand all of this inputs. I've got these frameworks around colonialism and, and oppression. And I also have these frameworks or like, so like, let's work it through, let's work it out. And I will, you know, take you in as one input. But the biggest lesson is that 
you need to seek information, you need to actively look for multiple sources, and then and you need to um, privilege the voices of those who are experiencing oppression in your understanding of tough issues. Yeah. Mom, well, we've got a question about being uh, African American Quakers. Do you want to start? <laughs> Uh, well, uh, I just found, found there's an interview with me on that. I guess it's it, there's a call the Black Qu Quaker Pro Project, something like that, which talks a bit in which I talk about being African American and and a Quaker. You know, my experience of Quakerism was what? Well, I, I was going to say that there weren't many of us, and that was what I knew about Quakerism. But in fact, I did know um, Bayard Rustin, for example, whose grandmother was, uh, was a Quaker in Chester County in, in Philadelphia. Uh, and I, so I had a sense of, of a long history. I think, you know, now that, <laughs> now that for example, the London, or it's called British Yearly Meeting now has rejected the name of William Penn for the, their gathering room because he owned slaves. Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, there's a lot of rethinking or re, re uh, assessing of the relationships of, of Quakers. And, and I, I, it's a, it's a, there's a lot to talk about and there are, I mean, it's a little bit like what, what Alicia was saying about Palestine and Israel. I mean, it, these are not easy problems to, that, that have solutions or even, they're not even understandable in any simple way. Um, and, and it's partly the complexity that, that we, we struggle to address. I mean, for me, um, the answer to my parents' involvement in Quakerism has to do with they're looking for they're they're being raised in the in the Black Baptist Church in the South and rejecting some of what was demanded of them there, and finding that they still needed a spiritual a connection, which they found um, in Germantown meeting. Uh, but they also, you know, my mo <laughs> my mother always said when I came home and asked her something like, "How come? How come you want me to call the the, the bus driver Mister Mister Jones when everybody else calls him Richard?" And my mother would say, "We have to teach people," <laughs> mm -hmm. and and my now my daughters now says, yeah, but they should learn by now <laughs> these things that we're teaching them. Um, but in any case, um, you know, there is a way for me, for my generation, for me, let's say someone born um, more than 80 years ago, uh, I, this country belongs to me and Quakerism <laughs> belongs to me too. And I understand it's not perfect. And, and uh, for me, I'll, I'll tell you, and this has letter, less to, maybe less to do with Quakerism, but, but to, to your question, I am comforted by the fact that our current president talked about being a more perfect union. Not a, it's not perfect, it's, it isn't perfect. And the point is that we need to listen to each other and, and address whatever it is that we, we find um, lacking. So I wanted my mother to start that question because I because because here's you're going to see some here's some different stories on this one. Um, so I I'm the first birthright friend in the family. Um, being mixed race and Quaker means that people assume that the Quakerism in you is white, not black, <laughs> which was not the case. My father certainly wasn't a Quaker. Um, he wasn't a believer at all. Um, and um, um, for me, the, the peace testimony, the racial justice testimony, um, the testimony that there's, that there is that of God in every person were, were form formative, spiritual, theological, ethical, um, parts of who I am. And they they have always stayed with me as central to who I am. 
Um, but as a young person, and um, particularly as I left the comfort of the Quaker community in Germantown, Pennsylvania, and um, um, ventures in the world, I, I had a different set of experiences. I mean, I, so first of all, I should say I spent a year, one of a very important year for me as an intern at the French Committee on National Legislation in Washington. Um, just an incredible learn formative experience for me and learning about politics, learning about social justice and about, um, you know, uh, representing truth to power in those, all those ways. And with Ed Snyder as my mentor, is really tr truly remarkable figure. Um, but in many ways that was to me that they, I, I, I didn't know it at the time, but as moved, time moved on, that was sort of, that was my exit in some ways from, from, from institutional Quakerism. Um, as you know, it was a difficult for year for me because I was in a white world and I didn't have necessarily know how to, um, to deal with that. I was disappointed by the institution because it was a white world. Um, and I don't mean FCNL, I mean Quakerism more broadly. Um, but I also was more importantly, it wasn't, it wasn't disappointment. It was the sense that I don't know how to navigate this. I need to figure out something different if I'm going to be who I am. And then, and I, so it was part of my rethinking what it meant to be mixed too, that to foreground my blackness, my black my sense of black identity much more so. And for me, that meant, it turned out, I don't, it, was, it wasn't intentional, but it eventually became that I wasn't, Quakerism didn't, wasn't a space in which I could figure out how to do that. I had to find other spaces to do that. Um, so, and that's a long story. I'm happy to say more about that, but, but, but the, the kind of is that my, you know, I'm, I'm, my wife is, um, is Catholic uh, and, um, uh, and for her, the Catholic church served a purpose that the Quaker church didn't serve for me. Uh, and so we raised our family in, in the Catholic church. And, and, you know, I learned a lot about, cause I knew nothing <laughs> that in terms of the social justice testimonies, there were really important overlaps. Um, even theologically, I could find the connections. I mean, they're not, there are many differences, obviously, but there were important connections about one's relationship to God and to, and to um, working for a just world. Um, and that's what our children were raised with institutionally to the extent which they, uh, at least it says, know anything about Quakerism would be more through kind of the feel of the family rather than any kind of formal teaching or formal involvement in Quaker institutions. That's not true. I went to um, Lincoln. Oh, that's true. Same so, more. Yeah, and so this is, this is actually really fascinating because to, to round this out, um, as Dad said, I was raised going to Catholic church every Sunday. Um, but actually being multiracial was really helpful when I thought about religion. I was like, oh, I'm half Quaker, half Catholic. And people would be like, that's not a thing. <laughs> it is for me. <laughs> but I really, like, I very much took um, from each side what was most helpful. And so I, and Carol asked the question in the chat. Um, particularly around how did the Quaker influence help me with that anger? And it absolutely did around thinking about um, the nonviolence, both from the civil rights movement, but also nonviolence from, from Quakerism and from what I was learning um, through, through my dad mainly, but then also um, her attending a Quaker school for one year. Um, and then ultimately, I think I had a very similar relationship with Catholicism as, as dad had with Quakerism in that I was like, as a, as a queer person, this place doesn't won't let me get married with a priest. Like I, I can't do this. Um, you know, I, I'm 13. Another another uh, problem point for my parents. I asked the. I was like, okay, so priests are married to God. You should sit like you always show God as a guy. Like priests are gay. Like that was that was kind of my antagonist relationship with my poor Catholic Church. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think like um, who knows what my what my spiritual journey will be for the rest of my life but for when growing up and, and thus far um they've been super important for helping me navigate emotions and think about important concepts um and yet institutionally I, I'm always at a loss for like what would be a, a regular and stable spiritual home um for a number of reasons and I think uh it's really easy nowadays, particularly my generation, like there isn't, there's, you know, not a, a, an assumption that you will find a spiritual home necessarily anymore. Um, but it's absolutely one that I would be open to if I found a place that was both queer friendly, uh, you know, had racial justice at the forefront, um, but, but then 
was able to be really critical of itself. And I think that's a really hard thing for any institution, particularly religious ones. You know, one of the things that struck me even in the beginning, Matthew, when you were um, sharing the, the photographs though, um, and, and, I, and I see that and feel that here in our work, working, you know, in an organization that's really grounded in those Quaker values is all three of you demonstrate that those values and everything you do. I mean, it, it, that came through and even it, that picture and you're, you're holding your head and thinking about that and, and working through consensus and that, you know, that's, those are all part of who you are, it seems, and, and probably have played a, a greater role than, than maybe you even recognize at times, I would imagine. I, I also, I absolutely, I think that we, you know, certainly for me, looking back at something that I've done or somebody as praising me or thanking me that I didn't realize I did that. Um, it, it is, um, it, there's some very powerful teaching there that, that, that I just continue to appreciate. I, I also need to say that I have served um, on, a, on the board of a Jesuit school <laughs> as a result of having uh, uh, connections, the kinds of connections that I have. And, and I, I know that that board, that school was very, is very proud of the fact that they had a Quaker member. <laughs> and I learned a whole lot about uh, as, as what Alicia alluded to was that it, the intersection of many uh, very powerful values that, 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 uh, mm -hmm. um, that, that bring me to admire the way in which um, at least the, the church, that church can uh, wrestle with, with difficult questions. And, and I, think, I think the Quaker uh, struggle right now with some difficult questions are, is, is, is all to the good that we, we are able to, to, to embrace the fact that we are challenged by them. Right, we can't change them. <laughs> now we can't change the past, but but right. what impact right. can we have on the future? Mm -hmm. And those lessons, absolutely. I, I guess as we wind our time down, and I, I really hate to, um, because I, I think we could talk for hours. Um, I, I so appreciate um, hear you sharing your experiences. But I think the question I struggle with, and, and I, I look to each of you, um, as educators and, act, and activists who've impacted so much change, how do you help guide us, you know, in terms of next steps, our responsibilities in our communities and, and in our work and in our lives that, you know, it, it seems like there's never been a time when, when it's ever been um, more clear yet, how do we get there? What, what, what advice, what guidance do you have for us and how, how as a family, you, you have um, such a legacy and a strength amongst each other. I mean, Alicia sharing about calling your dad to talk through that conversation and about what's happening in Palestine and Israel. I mean, what a gift to have that amongst each other. Um, how, how do we, where do we go with this? What, what are the next steps? What, what guidance do you have for all of us? <laughs> I know right, that's a question in advance. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think, I think one of, um, so I have lots of lots of thoughts. And I think the, the first thing is to know that absolutely every institution in the world right now is in the same situation, right? Which is, mm -hmm. we have a complicated history. We have a desire and a, and a lot of energy in this current moment to, to do better. Um, but it is probably the, we want we want an easy roadmap that we can complete in 24 months, <laughs> and that doesn't <laughs> exist, right? I, I mean, time, right? exactly. And I, so I think that there is um, there is a an, a like uh, you have to understand what you're what you want to do, right? Um, and, and really really get crystal clear about it because it's not just like it might well it might be it might be we want to have uh, you know what a a monthly conversation about this topic and that's how we're going to start out and, and let's see where it goes from there there's i think a lot of really ambitious statements right out there right now like we're going to absolutely reimagine the you know uh 
equity processes by which this organization runs. And it's like, well, what does that mean? Like, cause that, when I hear that, I'm here, okay, we're putting together a committee that's meeting to create, you know, 10 recommendations that we are then committing 10% of our profits to, blah, 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 blah. So there's, I think there's a range and it's a, it's okay to be where your organization is, right? It's okay to say, okay, let's be really specific about what this moment is calling us to do. Um, and let's not underestimate the type of commitment that that is, that it is, we are committing to be uncomfortable. We are committing to regularly working. We are committing to not having an end point. We are committing to doing things differently um, than we want, than we thought was pr probably correct. And we're committing to bringing in external perspectives that don't currently exist. Um, and I think that that piece about it being really uncomfortable is probably the hardest for my peers at my now corporate job to take in, <laughs> right? It's just being uncomfortable is very, very difficult. We're not taught to do that very well, um, particularly in institutional settings. Um, and we're always, I mean, I'm, I've been trained over this past three years post-college to like end every meeting with a resolution and some next steps, right? And that's not what this, that's not what this journey entails. Um, so, I, but I think like a commitment to the uncomfortable and a commitment to knowing that this isn't gonna be wrapped up in a, in a bow in a year or two is probably the, the two most important uh, things for institutions right now. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. Anybody else want to weigh in on that? I'm one? tempted to leave the, the final word to the management consultant because I thought that was fascinating. <laughs> um, although there, I, I could hear the educators in there as well. Um, you know, I, I guess the historian would say simply that, um, yeah, we don't know where we're going. Um, um, but I would also say, I, I texted my mother during uh, President Biden's speech last month and I said, that is the most optimistic speech about the possibilities for change that a U.S. president has given since 1965. I'm sure of it. Um, and there is a there is a, a this is a moment of possibility um, that I wouldn't have predicted five years ago. And 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 this is on the hardest issues on inequality, on racial justice, on climate change, um, things that we thought were insoluble, and 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 they're not any easier now. But we have a sense that as a people, as a society. There is possibility. Now there's deep danger too, and we can talk about the current political moment in really complicated ways. But, but I would I would bring optimism as the you know that, that in fact people can make fix this world, this society, both through government through action. There is the possibilities for change that did not seem so clear to us mm -hmm. certainly a generation ago, and, and probably not a decade ago. So, so I, I will I will um, I, I I was asked to consider reading one of my poems and I, 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 there, I'm gonna read a short one just that speaks, I think, to this. It's called Bending Over the River. Look, that rainbow is bending over the Delaware, dropping east into South Jersey. Shall we search there for the pot of gold? I don't think so. Better take the bus west on Walnut. I hope the rain stops before the sun sets. Perhaps we can some, grab some tickets at the Academy for Patti LaBelle. I, for one, still be, believe the, that the arc, the, the moral universe bends toward justice. That really says it. <laughs> that moment of silence. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Um, what an amazing hour to spend with the three of you. I so appreciate it. And I thank everyone for joining us and for your input, your questions and your comments today. Um, I do want to just share um, this one last thing um, as we end our time today. Um, but I, I do want, as Joan just read her poem from her book, Once I Met an Elephant, uh, in Matthew's book, Up South. Um, I, I want to just share this. I, I, Matthew, I, I think that's a really powerful um, testament to the work you've done. But in 2006, Up South won the Li Liberty Legacy Foundation Award 
for the best book in civil rights history from the Organization of American Historians. And I can only imagine um, what a prestigious award that was um, and recognition of the work that you did um, in that book and, and the subsequent work you're doing now. You're, you're working on another book today, right? Yes, on um, American politics in the late 20th century and African-American mayors. Wow. You'll have that done next week? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully in the next year, I actually have a leave. Wow. Coming, so I'm very excited. How long have you been working on that? Since the one, previous one came out, <laughs> a long time. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, thank you so much. I so appreciate your time today and, and would love to have you back sometime um, to continue this conversation. And uh, I look forward to the opportunity to continuing um, to build our relationship and join in in this work. That's so important. So thank you so much. And thanks to everyone for joining us. And thank you for thank you. getting us to do it. Uh, it's, it. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Have a great weekend, everybody. <laughs>